Good morning everyone and today we are going to discuss about the infectious diseases and uh, tell you the importance about the infectious diseases. Uh, infections are the most common cause of acute illnesses in children. They are worldwide. There are many types of infections. There is respiratory infections. There is diarrhea. There is uh, fatal infections like uh, <clears throat> meningitis, encephalitis, there is malaria and now there are many rashes in the uh, children like uh, chicken pox, measles and things like this. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, what we are going to do by the way in this one uh, because uh, there is a lot of overlap for example uh, I teach you meningitis and encephalitis in neurology, right? So, of course, like the meningitis and encephalitis will be same infections in the children. Uh, you had already done pneumonia. You had already done a lot of infectious diseases already. So, of course, we cannot talk about all infectious diseases in the children. So, that's why I'm going to focus on either the differences or either the infections which you haven't touched before. Now, um, the important thing is like uh, in most of the infections, uh, the most common presentation is fever, right? And as we know, like how we define fever, fever is when the temperature of the body is higher or simply it is more than 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, Celsius or 100.4 Fahrenheit um, and whenever like a child present with fever or you get a febrile child so of course we take the history we do the examination and what we do we basically try to find out the focus of the infection so now uh, you can see over here uh, this one is like they are showing a febrile child and you can see upper respiratory tract infections. They are very common, maybe coincidental with other more serious illnesses, right? Uh, we will discuss them in respiratory respiration. I will take you symptomatic wise. I, 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 I talk about symptoms mostly because... Uh, the presentation of the patient is always on symptoms, right? So, it's better to know the approaches, how to approach a patient of fever, rather than discussing the conditions. So see, uh, you see the otitis media. Now, otitis media we have covered in ENT. So see, now what's important, important here is always examine tympanic membrane in febrile children. Now that's very important, so never ever um, let it go, simply. Uh, tonsillitis, so of course always examine the oral cavity. See either there is any strider. So if there is any strider, of course it shows like the patient maybe have, the child maybe have croup or epiglottitis. We will discuss them in respiration or bacterial tracheitis. You examine the chest and you will found that, okay, there is, uh, on auscultation, you found some findings of crackles and stuff like this, so, or wheezing, for example. So, a child presenting with fever, cough, raised respiratory raise, chest recessions, abnormal auscultation. In infants, auscultation may be normal. Diagnosis may require chest x-ray, okay. So, this thing. Then, septicemia can present with fever. Can be difficult to recognize in absence of rash before shock develops. And early signs are tachycardia, tachypnea, and poor perfusion need to start antibiotics on clinical suspicions without waiting for culture results, right? And then, of course, like meningitis and encephalitis, now you guys have covered that thing. So the children, they don't give typical signs like, uh, uh, I'm talking about infants, by the way because pediatrics deal with the adolescents as well. So they don't give like Kernick signs positive or Brzezinski sign positive, rather they have vague presentation like 
lethargy, loss of interest in surroundings, drowsiness or even coma or seizures. Older children give the typical findings of neck stiffness, Kernig sign and things like this, right? Infants, they have non-specific symptoms and signs. So whenever like they have raised intracranial pressure, like they have reduced conscious level, they have abnormally pupillary reflex responses, they have abnormal posturing, okay? So now uh, you can see over here, see, they, they are talking about the late signs like papilledema, bulging fontanelle in infants, opistotonus is like a abnormal posturing, simply you can say, right? This thing. So uh, one of the reasons, like that's why I put this slide over here. Because you have done uh, meningitis and encephalitis. So see, uh, we take the history, we do the examination, nothing is new guys, just this is the only difference that bulging fontanelle which is not present, like fontanelle are not present in the adult so. And then we go for the investigations and these are the signs associated with neck stiffness like Brzezinski signs or Kernick sign, you already know. And these are the contraindications for lumbar puncture. Anyhow, the important thing which I would like to mention over here is meningococcemia. Now, any child who is presenting with uh, fever and <clears throat> you can say non- uh, blanchable rash think about meningococcemia because it is lethal it can kill the patient so for example I can show you over here this thing meningococcal septicemia and you can see like uh, a child presented with rash and loss of consciousness with fever so see, like we can see the rash. Now this rash is non-blanchable. When you when you basically compress it, so the rash stays like this. It, it is not blanchable. It doesn't become the skin color even on pressure. And we do a glass test, you know, we can put the glass here and we can see like either the rash is changing its color or not. So any child, any child who is presenting with meningococcal septicemia. So you can see like a this seven year month old boy presented with a 12 hour history of lethargy and a spreading purpuric rash. In hospital it required immediate resuscitation and transfer to pediatric intensive care unit for multi organ failure. The gross edema is from leak of capillary fluid into the tissue. He required colloid and inotropic support and peritoneal dialysis for renal failure. He made a full recovery. So see. How the child looks like before and after. So anyhow guys like whenever you found such a thing especially purpuric petechial rash which is non-blanchable this is a medical emergency. So what we do by the way if you are in periphery if you're not in a you can say in a good setup or a <clears throat> especially what we say as tertiary care center we don't delay the treatment um, for the blood cultures or anything like this. Rather, what they do is like immediately take the blood sample of the baby, send it to the lab and without delaying, give a shot of antibiotic and transfer the baby to a tertiary care center where all supportive treatments, ICUs and all these things are available. The mortality is really, really, really high. Okay. Uh, remember this thing very 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 important point so uh, now <coughs> you can see over here seizures someone who's presenting with seizures think about febrile convulsions meningitis encephalitis child may have periorbital cellulitis this is like infection around the eye and uh, can involve the eye as well the child may present with rash which we are going to discuss in detail. So the rashes can be 
viral exam terms due to viruses like chickenpox, measles, erythema, infectiosum and <clears throat> many causes are there or it could be from meningococcal infection which I was talking about. UTI. Urine sample needed for an, any seriously ill child or any febrile illness that does not settle. So UTI. <clears throat> now, UTI is quite important in child, okay, uh, even in old age, because the presentation can be not a typical one of UTI, rather it could be a non-typical type of presentation. See, up to half of children who have UTI have structural abnormality of the urinary tract. <clears throat> and pyelonephritis especially may damage the growing kidney by forming renal scar, which may result in hypertension and chronic renal failure. Now, whenever a child, especially a boy, because girls, they get more often UTI. They get any type of UTI. <clears throat> First of all, we diagnose that, we treat it, and then we do further investigation. So what kind of first further investigations are needed? Basically to rule out any structural abnormality in the urinary tract. So you will be doing consider, you will consider the ultrasound of the kidney and the urinary tract. DEMSA scan is done to check for the scars three months after UTI. Okay, there are there are two scans. One is DEMSA scan, one is uh, DPMA scan. So DEMSA, remember there is S in it, so it is used to check for the scarring. And what we do in boys, especially, you know, we do a micturating cystourethrogram. So we take the images while the child is urinating. So because if there is any reflux of the urine going back, so it can damage the kidney. So that thing can be done. <clears throat> micturating cystourethrogram. So treat the infection with antibiotics, advice about medical preventive measures, high fluid intake regular voiding, double maturation, prevent or treat constipation, good perineal hygiene, lactobacillus acidophilus can be given, advice to check urine culture if developed clinical features, suggestive of non-clinical illness. And if renal scarring or reflux on investigation, then consider antibiotic prophylaxis and if it is manageable or treatable cause of uh, what you can say, the structural abnormality to treat that. <clears throat> Whenever they present with abdominal pain, so appendicitis, pyelonephritis, hepatitis, diarrhea, we have discussed, right? So, osteomyelitis can occur, like which is the infection of the bone or septic arthritis. And whenever some any child have prolonged fever, so think about uh, bacterial infection, for example, UTI, bacterial endocarditis, like uh, you can say. Uh, the non-common type of uncommon type of infection so simply the important thing now here is what any child who is presenting with fever um, explore the history the point is to find the focus of the infection either the infection is in the joint either it's in the heart either it's in the lungs either it's in the ear either it's in the throat either it's around the eye or either in the GIT right so ask for the duration of the fever, pattern of the fever, associated symptoms, exposures, any drug usage, any daycare attendant, remember binds, how's the birds, how's the immunization, how's the nutrition, how's the development, any travel history, any, uh, ask about the social history as well. And then we examine the baby, uh, we check the general appearance either like uh, uh, the baby is conscious or unconscious either there is toxic look we check the vitals we check the growth charts and then we examine from head to toe com covering h e e n t head eyes nose ears and throat we examine the chest we examine the heart we examine the abdomen we examine the genitalia we examine the limbs okay so simply, the point here is to tell you guys, we have to find the focus of the infection. 
okay so <clears throat> based on what kind of thing you found um, we go for that now the important thing is something called a septic workup uh, okay as a general rule uh, uh, any child who is less than six months of age we basically go for septic workup so what is septic workup basically you are founding the source of the infection right so uh, simply um, <clears throat> There is a criteria which is used for that that is that that is called as Rochester criteria. So this is one of the criteria like you don't have to remember this criteria But this is one of the criteria which can be used but like there are other ways as well So uh, for example Rochester criteria says like if the child looks well clinically the WBC's counts are not uh, are between 5 to 15 or uh, the urine analysis is normal or the stool is normal so you can say uh, there is very low or not too serious risk of any infection or bacterial infection to be more like <clears throat> uh, specific so what is uh, what is septic workup by the way septic workup is simply when the children um, are uh, too young for example Okay, too young, like less than six months of age or, you know, they, always we go for septic workup or we can say like the full septic workup. Even in older children, we can go for septic workup. For example, when the child have very toxic look, uh, the child is unconscious, the child have uh, different type of, or you can say very sick type of child, right? So we go for blood, culture and sensitivity sensitivity okay and before initiating antibiotics remember this thing uh, we go for CBC blood complete count uh, we go for urine culture uh, CBC we go for um, urine culture and sorry, and sensitivity uh, we go for lumbar puncture we check this you take the csf and we do culture and sensitivity okay we do a chest x-ray and if git symptoms are present if git symptoms are present then stool culture and sensitivity and if git symptoms are present right so this is like not an important part rather if the git symptoms are present so we go up for a full septic workup and like simply what we are doing guys again we are just finding the focus of the infection nothing else more than that just finding the focus of the infection and when we find the focus of the infection we treat that okay one of the thing is uh, rashes with fever right now this is quite interesting uh, now uh, <clears throat> what kind of rashes are there? See, the rashes can be maculopapular. Uh, macule is a palpable rash. And papule, uh, sorry, papule is the palpable rash. Macule is like the plain rash with just like the color of the skin has changed. The rash can be vesicular or bullous or pustular. And the rash can be petechial or purpurate. Or you can say the, the superficial bleeds. So you can see over here, Maculopapular causes can be caused by viruses, bacteria, and others like Rosiella infantum, like uh, uh, parvovirus or slap cheek syndrome, like measles, like rubella. Uh, here it's written uncommon if immunized, like nowadays we give MMR vaccination to all the kids. So that's why they are not so common. Can be caused by bacteria like scarlet fever, Erythema marginatum like rheumatic fever, typhoid fever, it gives rose spots, Lyme disease, erythema migraine, so can be others like Kawasaki disease or juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, can be vesicular bullous or pustular like viral causes, can be chickenpox, herpes simplex, bacterial can be impetigo, boils, staphylococcal infections, and others. 
erythema multiforme or Stephen Johnson syndrome. So, purpuric and petechial <coughs> uh, bacteria like meningococcal, viral like enteroviruses and others is Hinoxcon and purpura. We have to cover these two conditions especially, right, in the coming lectures. Malaria can get. Now, uh, what I will be doing is like I'm, I'm going to talk about different conditions one by one and I'm going to take the help of Bing as well to show you how it looks like the things. Um, <clears throat> now guys there are different conditions you know viruses or you can say infections like I can show you like this is one of the classification. Um, <clears throat> to start with you can see here like the slap cheek syndrome. Um, now not to get confused like everyone have different names okay and uh, they are not so difficult, especially when you will revise them and you would understand, okay, what kind of things, you know, how to remember. And each condition have different names. For example, one of the conditions is called as erythema infectiosum. Okay. Now, this condition is also called as um, fifth disease. It is also called as slabbed cheek syndrome, right? Now, uh, why it is called as the slab cheek syndrome or the fifth disease, I will show you. Um, <clears throat> because the child cheeks look like that someone has slapped the child. Okay, see, see this one, see this one, or you can see this one. Okay, it looks like that someone has slapped the child cheeks. Okay, that's why it is called as slap cheek syndrome. It is also called as a fifth disease. Now, why it is called as a fifth disease? Because of how it presents. So, now, this is caused by parvovirus B19. And the incubation period is around 4 to 14 days. Okay. Now, one of the things which we have to remember about this the condition is like when the condition is transmitted, like can be transmitted to other kids. Because, you know, whenever like they have this condition, so... Basically, we don't allow or we ask them to exclude them from the school because like the other children can be safe from them. So, once they become asymptomatic, you know, their transmission becomes almost like uh, negligible. It is spread by respiratory secretions and how it present is um, or the clinic, the rash, or you can see the clinical features. Okay, so see how we diagnose these rashes is basically depends on the look of the rashes and the distribution. So the look and the distribution of the rash is very important. So basically, they have erythematous maculopapular rash. And, uh, uh, you know, this rash is present where? Bilaterally on the cheeks. Bilateral on the cheeks. And one of the features of this rash is, you know, this area around the mouth is always, already, always spared. You can see. You can say there is circumoral sparing. Okay. It can affect the trunk and the limbs as well, but mostly on the cheek. So that's what is called a slap cheek syndrome. So basically what happened, like initially they have uh, like a flu-like illness for 7 to 10 days. And then, you know, um, rash started appearing. 
Uh, Sometimes, you know, like uh, a less common type of presentation is also called a star complex. So what is star complex? It's simply um, they present with S for sore throat. Okay. Um, sore throat, A is for arthritis and R is for rash. So like this is called, a, that's why it is called a star complex. A less common presentation like this. So uh, now guys, you know, uh, I will not take too much time on this one. Remember it's a viral condition. So the management is supportive. Okay, so management is supportive. Now what is supportive? You like just knowing supportive is not enough brother. You must know what is supportive treatment. Supportive and symptomatic. Fever, give paracetamol. Drink a lot of water, bed rest, school exclusion, stuff like this, right? So that's it. Now remember one thing, you know, one of the side effects of the, or the complication of parvovirus B19 is aplastic anemia. So simply a complication of erythema infectious then could be a plastic crisis, right? So this is called as the fifth disease. Uh, now, uh, other than that, there is one condition called as hand, foot, mouth disease. Now in China, you know, they, they, they are doing the vaccination of, of this condition as well. Not worldwide, rather in China they are doing. So how it present, it's like you can see, hand, uh, foot, uh, mouth disease is basically, uh, you can see like they are showing the mouth, they are showing the hands, they are showing the feet. And you can see like the typical rash, how they appear. Now, hand, foot, mouth disease is basically caused by Kogsaki group A virus, okay, and the incubation period is uh, three to five days, okay, and now, um, the bad thing about this condition is what, like, uh, they are, they can transfer the infection, okay, so transmission, tra they can transmit the infection uh, after you can say one to seven days after symptoms appear um, up to months okay so this is a bad thing and the transmission is always like the direct contact okay uh, even the body fluids okay and that's the reason like you know for example in kindergartens if anyone have hand foot mouth disease like they give off to almost all the class simply and see how it appears like there is uh, vesicles and pustules, okay. You can see like pustules, you can see over here, pustules, pustules, over here, okay. Uh, and see there is erythematous base or red base, you can say, right. And what is the distribution? Mouth, hands, and feet, okay. So, this thing. So, now you remember like you know viruses have uh, two type of features but this is called as virus exanthem or what happen on the skin and there is something called as enanthem what is enanthem like what happens inside so uh, when basically um, you uh, ask them to open their mouth you can see like the vesicles in the posterior oral cavity or pharynx you know this is called as enanthem okay so it is like simply <laughs> So, uh, again, the treatment is uh, supportive. It's a viral condition. Uh, this thing and uh, now, um, one of the condition is measles. Okay. Now, measles uh, is basically caused by a virus called as morbiliform virus. Okay. Morbiliform virus. The name of that virus is mor billy form more billy virus okay um, now you know um, to talk about measles um, sorry like I must remove this thing it will create okay so measles uh, how it ha happened is like uh, uh, the incubation period is like around you can say 10 to 14 days and it it is spread by it's an airborne infection so it's a highly infectious condition. That's why, you know, they give vaccination for that. And uh, 
they become infectious or they are infectious like four days before and four days after the rash, up to the eighth day. Now guys, uh, how these patients present is basically they present with uh, or like the rash looks like erythematous maculopapular rash. Okay, and you can see over here or uh, I can show you some more photos of this thing. For example, okay, a clear one and close one, maybe we can found something. See. Erythematous maculopapular rash is there. Uh, now, what is the distribution of this rash is very important to learn because uh, um, simply this rash, you know, what happens is, uh, um, okay, I will, I will open over here like some clear photographs, okay, measles. So, okay, so how what is the distribution of this rash like which is an interesting thing like uh, it starts at the hairline okay you can see over here maybe rash hairline uh, like measles you know uh, okay basically they are not showing any child from the back but it starts below the hairline okay and uh, below the hairline it starts and it spreads downwards okay it spreads downwards so start above and goes downwards and one of the thing to remember about this one is it spares the palms and the soles now how the patient present is basically you like very important thing to remember there are two or three things about important to remember about this one one thing is three c's so what are the th three C's? Cuff, coryza, and conjunctivitis. So the patient present with cuff, coryza, and conjunctivitis. And when and what is the enanthem? When you will open their mouth, basically what we see, you see is um, complex spots. Okay, what you see is complex spots. So see, um, basically. Um, when you ask them to open the mouth, so on their buccal mucosa, you can see very clear a complex spot. Okay, so you can see like this whitish color of spot here. You can see over here, complex spots. These are called as complex spots, right? So, like this one, okay, complex spot. So, three C's remember about coriza. So, uh, what is coriza, by the way? Uh, if you write coriza, just coriza, you know, on the internet, basically what you will find is a lot of photographs of hens. But if you will write measles coriza, then you will find this thing. See, this is coriza. Okay, so uh, basically, um, this is a presentation. So three C's and complex spots. And what is the rash distribution? I remember, guys, uh, this one um, uh, starts from uh, below the hairline and then go down towards the legs, right? And uh, uh, Three C's, cuff, conjunctivitis, and coriza. And what is coriza? This is basically the inflammation of the nasal mucosa, and it can be completely seen by on examination. Okay. Um, this is, or you can see over here, see this is the coriza, this is the inflammation of the mucosal surfaces. Okay. So this is how measles present with. And you can see over here um, how the disease behaves, the temperature, these are the days. The rash, complex spots, conjunctivitis and coriza and cuff. And these are the complications. Okay, remember viruses can cause any itis. I, I always say this thing. So no matter it's like sinusitis, it's rhinitis, it's pericarditis, it's encephalitis, it's meningitis, it's dermatitis, it's myocarditis, it's any type of itis viruses can cause. Okay. So this is how uh, measles rash present with. Okay, then there is one rash called as uh, um, roseola. Remember from rose, roseola. Okay, it comes from rose. So, roseola. Okay. Now, uh, as I told you that, you know, uh, 
all this one have different names okay so even roseola rubella uh, now roseola the other name of this condition is also called a six disease so i told you about fifth disease so this one is also called a six disease okay so this is the other name of um, uh, roseola and all this condition have some certain typical names in local languages by the way this one is caused by a human um, herpes virus 6 okay so uh, now uh, human herpes virus 6 so very easy to remember 6 and 6 disease right so this is how I remember by the way and the incubation period is 5 to 15 days and how for how many days it stays communicable is not known and if I will write over here roseola and I will tell you the features of this condition uh, actually when you see the things you never forget so when you will see the real patients okay see basically they have a pinkish color rash okay you can see over here pinkish color rash it's blanchable rash okay and uh, how they present like first of all they have fever and once the fever goes away the rash started appearing and this rash started from starts from the neck and trunk and then it spread to the face and extremities so you can say uh, from inside rash goes outside so simply it affect the central part of the body it starts from the center and spreads peripherally right so this is how what is the distribution of the rash and uh, one very important feature about this condition is guys um, whenever like they have this thing so they have high grade fever okay now why i'm telling you mentioning this thing high grade fever because this is a very common cause of febrile seizures you know febrile seizures like the seizures which occur due to high grade fever so they have they may have this thing febrile seizures in roseola and uh, uh one thing which I just wanted to show you is like not so common, but um, in Roseola there is something called as Nagayama, Nagayama spots. So when you will see the soft palate of these patients in the uvula, you will found small, 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 see these spots, okay. This is called as Nagayama spots, Nagayama spots, okay. So this is called as Nagayama spots. So. Uh, there is pinkish rash okay there is pinkish rash <clears throat> and it is associated with high grade fever and there could be nagayama spots so remember complex spots are in measles and this one is like the nagayama spots okay so this one have one of the complication which is uh, this one uh, <clears throat> um, febrile seizures then there is rubella <clears throat> so okay yes uh, sorry i want i forget to tell you by the way okay uh, after rubella i can tell you this thing so rubella is also called as german measles the other name is german measles and also it is also called as three days measles and the thing which i wanted to tell you is uh, <clears throat> uh, like uh, um, okay uh, okay leave that thing by the way I think like just to complicate the things okay so uh, anyhow like this one is also called as German measles okay rubella and uh, how it looks like again I wanted to show you um, rubella uh, see like rubella uh, this is how a patient of rubella is okay so this one is caused by ruby virus ruby virus right and uh, rubella is caused by ruby virus 14 to 21 days is the incubation period and they remain symptomatic they mean they mean uh, they remain contagious uh, or they can spread the infection seven days before and after the rash okay 
So seven days before and seven days after, and it spread by droplet infection. It's a droplet infection. So now uh, how it appears, like how the skin looks like, it's a pink maculopapular rash, and uh, it starts from the face and then spread to the neck and trunk. Okay, and it can be present as a star complex. Uh, one of the thing, guys, which is very important about this condition and which is, you can say, which helps in diagnosis of this condition is basically, um, <clears throat> in the books you will find, like, they will be, they will be writing, like, they have uh, uh, occipital and, and retro auricular auricular lymphadenopathy okay like the lymph nodes get enlarged so then <clears throat> this is the important point about this one so this thing and uh, one of the infection is called as uh, chicken pox which is um, wait I'll show you how chicken pox look like looks like Okay. Um, chicken pox. Now, chicken pox is caused by a very solo zoster virus, right? We all know incubation period is like from 0 to 21 days. And see, incubation 20, 10 to 23, so up to 21 days, okay. Uh, they, they remain, uh, see, virus virus shedding. So, they, they remain um, contagious two days before eruption until five days, around five and a half days or six days, you can say, after eruption. It's an airborne infection now, you know, this one, very easy to understand this condition because, you know, uh, we call like, you know, we say like uh, chicken pox give polymorphic rash. So what is polymorphic like uh, a rash which have different forms? So simply in chicken pox, what you found is papules, vesicles, pustules and crusts. So you will found papules at the same time vesicles and at the same time pustules, right? So... Uh, what happens like, you know, they present with fever and, you know, they started having these uh, rash. Some of them, they will be papule. Some of them, they will become vesicle. Some of them, they will become pustules. And it is pruritic type of rash. The patient, they feel very uncomfortable. They, they, they can scratch it and there could be secondary bacterial infection. And that's why you can see like, you know, typical vesicular rash, 200 to 500 lesion starts on head and trunk progress to peripheries but just be just a few lesions or just can be a very few lesions and appears as crops of papules vesicles with surrounding erythema and infections can the like lesions may occur on the palate okay so uh, you can see over here or you can see over here very solid zoster virus right so a lot of complications are there, right? <clears throat> because it's virus and they can cause anything. So the treatment is mostly supportive and uh, we mostly give calamine lotion to the patients, you know, to apply because, you know, it's highly uncomfortable and uh, <clears throat> can cause problem, right? In the patients. So, uh, other than that, guys, uh, I wanted to show you or talk about one just one bacterial infection that is all connected very easy to understand and uh, one of my favorite topic by the way um, so basically what happens is uh, uh, what happens is there is something called as infectious pharyngitis right or pharyngitis or tonsillitis right so like uh, we have done this thing in ENT okay so uh, now what happens is uh, I, I just want to talk about a typical thing I'm not going to discuss all pharyngitis and uh, I think there's some spelling mistake in this one pharyngitis and there should be no A here okay so pharyngitis or tonsillitis. So what happened, like many people, um, okay, pharyngitis and tonsillitis, you know, it can be caused by 
multiple things like most commonly by viruses okay adenovirus and Coxsackie virus, CBV, CMV, it could be bacterial. So what I wanted to discuss today in specific is something called a strep throat. Now strep throat when it is caused by or which is caused by group A streptococcus, what happened is um, these children, of course, like they have strep throat, which is caused by group A streptococcus. It is also called as, or written as gas. Okay. So this kind of sub, uh, strep throat is more common in late winters or early springs. Okay. And uh, now they present with fever, they present with malaise, they present with headache, they present with abdominal pain, nausea, and things like this. Now the bad thing about this one is what? Um, basically, uh, nowadays we have in our GP clinics, we have what you can say a rapid strep test. Like anyone who presents with this sore throat, they can, they can run a rapid strep test and to see like either they have strep throat or not. So, uh, um, there are some scoring system as well. For example, one of the scoring system is called as MECLAS. Sorry, L S A A C criteria. So it is like only applied in the patients who are more than three years of age, and they say like uh, the mnemonic is hot lace. Anyone who is hot, fever is more than thirty-eight degrees centigrade. Hot L L is for lymphadenopathy. A is for age between three to fourteen. C is for no cuff and E is for erythematous or exudative tonsils. So uh, they point towards a suspected diagnosis of group A streptococcus. Now, why I am too much concerned about this thing? Because anyone who has streptococcus, strep throat, you know, they can develop complications. The complications are many, but I want to discuss just three complications over here, over here. One complication is called as, uh, which I'll be discussing, scarlet fever. One is called as rheumatic fever. And one is called as post streptococcal glow marulo nephritis okay now um, scarlet fever for example scarlet fever okay um, you can see like they are showing you some rash over here right and um, they are showing you the rash leave this woman I don't know why she's here maybe her name starts with scarlet or whatever right uh, so simply you can you can concentrate on these figure like photographs which I wanted to show you or a very uh, you can say interesting type of photograph is this one um, like a child who have a lot of rash here you can see so basically, these patients have a diffuse or you can say a journalized type of erythematous eruption. Erythematous means like red eruption. So what happened is uh, um, the patients who have strep throat. So uh, the group A streptococcus, you know, this one basically release a uh, exotoxin. So the body, they may have a delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction against that exotoxin okay so what happens is uh, um, simply like anyone who has scarlet fever okay uh, which is caused by delayed hypersensitivity against to the exotoxins of produced by group A streptococcus it starts with fever uh, with sore throat with the strawberry tongue 
see now uh, you can see over here a very important feature to remember so see like if you can see or pay attention over here see the tongue looks like a strawberry in this in this case okay you can see strawberries is like this right small small dots so they develop a strawberry tongue now um, basically 24 to 48 hours after pharyngitis when they have pharyngitis so after that 24 to 48 hours after pharyngitis they develop a rash okay now what are the characteristics of rash is very very easy to remember begins in growing okay axilla so see all the areas which are basically folded right neck anti cubital fossa okay now after that the rash become generalized and it feels like a sandpaper so that's why we call it a sandpaper rash when you feel the skin you will feel like you are uh, you are having your hands on a sandpaper and again like it's a non pruritic non painful with peri oral sparing and blanchable rash and then of course the rash fades away in the next three to four days and what is the treatment guys remember it's a bacterial infection so what should be the treatment simply treatment is antibiotics what kind of antibiotics penicillins if someone is allergic to penicillins then you can give macrolides okay so this is scarlet fever occurring because of what it's happening because of delayed type hypersensitivity against the exotoxin produced by group a streptococcus now all these things are connected i will tell you why see rheumatic fever is the next one it is a complication of what strep, strep throat rheumatic fever now rheumatic fever uh, is basically it's an inflammatory condition okay it's an inflammatory disease it's an inflammatory condition in which the antibodies which are formed against group A streptococcus have cross reactivity. Okay. Antibodies have what? Cross reactivity. What is cross reactivity? The antibodies which are formed against group A streptococcus now started acting against the person's own body, started damaging the person's own body. So, Basically, how we diagnose rheumatic fever, we use uh, John's criteria, okay? So, I will show you the John's criteria over here, not to waste more time, not yours, not mine. Um, John's criteria. So, um, this one is the John's criteria, you can say for, uh, okay, wait. Uh, for example, this one, okay. This one is a John's criteria, guys, for uh, the diagnosing the di diagnosis of uh, um, rheumatic fever. So, see, there are there are major manifestations, and there are minor manifestations. Okay, so carditis, polyarthritis, chorea, erythema marginatum, subcutaneous nodules, right? Fever, arthralgia, previous rheumatic fever, raised ESRC, RP, leukocytosis, first degree, heart block, right? So we need either two major to diagnose rheumatic fever or one major and two minor, okay, plus a supporting evidence of streptococcal infection. And what is the treatment? Treatment again remains same, penicillins, if the patient is penicillin allergic, then erythromycin. Why? Now, rheumatic fever complications are what? Like anyone who have rheumatic fever, guys, you know, later on, they can develop infective endocarditis or valvular heart disease so rheumatic fever because the it's a cross reactivity and it started damaging your own body so it can lead to 
complications or chronic complications. Complications can be acute, can be chronic, chronic complications can be valvular heart disease. Okay, could be infectious endocarditis. Okay, all those things can occur. And the last thing which I wanted to talk, which is again connected with this thing, is called as post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. It is also called as PSGN, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So, see, uh, you understand like why there is a uh, scarlet fever and why there is or rheumatic fever so now what happened uh, see this one is caused by um, delayed hypersensitivity against the exotoxin of the bacteria this one is the antibodies which are formed against group a streptococcus have cross reactivity started damaging their own body now this one is the antigens which are which are there and the antibodies which are formed, they are connected together. Now they started circulating in the body or you can say it is an antigen antibody mediated complement activation, which will circulate in the blood, which will go to the kidney and start damaging them, lead to proliferative, proliferative glomerulonephritis. So this one occurs around, uh, you can say, one to three uh, weeks after group A streptococcus infections, okay, whatever, skin or throat, whatever. So now guys, if you know what is glomerulonephritis, you know, these are the patients who will present with hematuria, uh, edema, cola colored urine and stuff like this, right? So these, these they, they present with this thing. Now, uh, post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis, you know, when, when we diagnose them, you know, we can check for these antigen antibodies. We can check uh, um, strepto, streptococcal antigens in the blood. Okay, we can check for the complement levels complement levels okay so of course like the complement levels will be uh, low especially c3 will be low because there is complement activation so the treatment is simply symptomatic fluid sodium restriction loop diuretics for hypertension treat edema if the renal functions are not coming back so put them on dialysis and things like this give them antibiotics penicillins and if they are penicillin and allergic, so put them on <laughs> macrolides, for example, right? And things like this. So, uh, <clears throat> that, that's why, you know, like, this is one of the thing, you know, uh, which I wanted to talk about. Um, rest, guys, uh, all the infectious diseases you have already done, you have done, um, in like, you know, in China, they teach us the infections, infectious disease, you know, limology. So, you have done most of the infections over there. Um, so, like, of course, like, uh, I don't think so. There's any topic which is left in infectious because uh, most of them you have covered over there. So, this is about the viruses, these, these the, sorry, rashes and all this stuff. And uh, rest, uh, like, uh, if you can, any, if you have any question, you can ask me. And otherwise, like, I will see you next week in, like, next week we are, well, there is just two weeks left of lectures. Uh, basically, just one week is left for the lectures, but uh, I will be covering nephrology, one lecture, neurology, one lecture, respiratory, one lecture, and rheumatology, one lecture. So, I will be making four lectures for that. So, uh, that's it. And if you have any question, you can ask me. I think I will see you next week.